Good day. Good day. My name is Dr. Lori Hepner, and I'm an assistant professor of environmental and occupational health sciences at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University School of Public Health. Today, I'll be talking about environmental exposures in older adults. So this is a, definitely geared for both healthcare professionals and community members. And like I said, I'm an assistant professor of environmental and occupational health sciences at the School of Public Health. And today I'll be reviewing what is environmental health. So you'll get a little primer on environmental health in general, and then thinking about epidemiology and then understanding how environmental exposures um, affect older adults, older adult ex um, outcomes, from environmental exposures, and I'll be talking about what that really means in terms of the, that population, and then discussing some considerations for clinical practice. You'll be able to define environmental health at the end of the session, identify environmental exposures in older adults, explain the relationship between environmental exposures and health outcomes in older adults, evaluate gaps in clinical care related to environmental exposure assessment in older adults. So first, what is environmental health? It's a big question, a big topic. But first, let's think about what is the environment? So some key terms and definitions for you. The environment is a lot of things. And whenever I ask students, what is the environment, I get a lot of different answers. Many people start thinking about or talking about greenery and nature and the outdoor air and the outdoor environment but it's really anything that we come in contact with, right? It's the circumstances, objects, or conditions by which one is surrounded. And that's the Merriam-Webster definition. Uh, it is also to be considered about in the scientific world. So it's a variety of physical, chemical, and bi biotic factors that act upon an organism, in this case, in public health, the human, in, or an ecologic community, and ultimately determine its form and survival. And so that's really more of a, a general, like a general and interpretive definition of what the environment is. It gives a little bit more detail. When we think about environmental health, though, we're thinking about what happens in the environment that will affect our health. So hazards and even non-hazards, but really a lot of times people think about it in more of a negative way. Um, the variations that we each have, each individual, and variations from population to population, community to community. And then what do we do to minimize and protect ourselves against hazards in the environment? And that's going to change over time as well, and it's going to depend on the population or the community that we're thinking about. So environmental health is a part of public health. Public, it's one of the cores, one, one of the tenets of public health. And when I think about environmental health, honestly, I think it covers everything. Um, in public health, and it really has an association, an interdisciplinary association with every other core that happens in public health. So we think about the relationships between individuals or people in their environment, how we can promote human health and well-being, and then what do we do when we, after we think about all of that, how do we actually create a healthy environment? How do we keep communities safe? When we talk about the environment combined with the health, there's three factors to focus on. There's the natural environment, as I mentioned. That's usually where people start to veer towards when I ask them, what is the environment? So the natural environment, the trees, the, the weather, the, the grass, the greenery, et cetera. What is out there that we are experiencing when we go out into the world? Then there's the built environment, which is what we make as humans. It's the anthropogenic um, effect and the anthropogenic buildings and features around us. And then there's the social environment because we can't leave out mental health, we can't leave out the psychosocial effects of the environment and our connection with other people. So the social environment is also a piece of the environment and health that we factor in. What do we study? I could probably spend, well I do, spend a semester at least talking about what is studied in environmental health, and still it's only the tip of the iceberg. I could probably talk for years about what we study in environmental health and cover every topic. But um, just an overview, some of the, the top topics that are covered in environmental health, we're always talking about air quality. This is something that now is, of course, in the middle of a 
or wherever we are in the pandemic, something that people are thinking about all the time, but in environmental health, we were thinking about it a long time ago. Water and sanitation, chemicals and radiation, or um, toxicology, which is a branch of environmental health. It's also practiced in clinical practice, but we think about it in environmental health as well. The built environment, which I just mentioned, which is everything that we've made and created around us that is human-made, climate change, or some may be calling it also climate crisis, climate emergency, what is happening in terms of weather patterns and extreme temperatures, and I'll be talking about that more also. Infection control and outbreaks or epidemics or pandemics, they are indeed environmental and a concern in environmental health. And occupational health is much like toxicology, it's a branch of environmental health or a, a, a factor in environmental health. So we of course have our social environment and the environment that we choose to put ourselves into and then the occupational environment that we may not have as much control over. As a reminder, maybe, or just to point out, Healthy People 2030 has a specific goal and objective in terms of environmental health, to promote healthier environments to improve health. And those objectives are to reduce exposures, as I mentioned at the beginning, we want to reduce exposures and make healthier, safer communities, to reduce heat-related outcomes. So now we're starting to think about extreme weather and heat outcomes in terms of healthy people. And compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act, or SDWA. And as we've seen in the past decade, there's a lot of concern about water. And we know from the Flint water crisis that there's definitely issues with potable water for, for us in our cities, in our urban areas, and also well water. Neighborhood and built environment is also an objective. Air and hazardous sites, toxic pollutants, and specifically in Healthy People 2030, they talk about schools. And then finally, transportation. And just like we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, there, is, um, there are issues in terms of commuting and transportation and access to transportation and reliable transportation and the health of our transportation system. So one of the goals is definitely to increase mass transit commutes because that will reduce the burden in terms of climate change from air pollution and from cars on the vehicles on the road. So I told you I would be talking about epidemiology and the overlap with environmental health. And so what does that really mean? So I had mentioned that toxicology is one way to consider environmental health, but epidemiology is fundamental to environmental health. Most of our studies in humans are observational in nature. So we have to think about epidemiology, which is the study of the distribution and determinants of health-related states and events in, in populations. And so you can really drill down with epi, but it is a way of observing populations, a way of determining Expo in environmental health, exposures and outcomes in a given population, a defined population. And it's also how we can apply uh, the outcomes that we learn about into the control of health problems. When we combine it, so that's just epi by itself. When we combine epi with environment, so environmental epi, we're definitely thinking about disease states and how they relate to exposures. So disease states and health conditions in population and their association with environmental factors. And um, I'll tell you that a lot of the times what you'll see in studies is that we're thinking one-to-one. -one. one exposure, one outcome. But the field of environmental epi, the field of environmental health is starting to or has started to very much branch out in terms of thinking about multiple exposures, how exposures interact, and then multiple outcomes. It's, it's a work in progress from my perspective to be thinking about how those all interact and how the best epi methods or and best statistical methods can be applied in order to determine what the root cause and association is between an exposure and an outcome when we're thinking in multiple terms. In environmental epi, because we're talking about human exposures and we're talking about observational studies, they tend to also be involuntary. So we're tending not to put people into experiments. We're not tending not to have people in situations where they're forced 
to be exposed to something. But these are just exposures that are around us every day, all day long. And how do we study them? And what, do, what are we learning about those exposures from everyday exposures? And as I've mentioned, these are also included in the occupational environment. So whether involuntary or voluntary, or perhaps not even known in the occupational environment. And again, less control in that situation, usually. So some contributions that epidemiology has had to the study of environmental health, population-based studies. So we know that we have better data, we have good data when we're looking at populations and studying the associations between exposures and outcomes. We know that we're looking at observational data when we're dealing with epidemiological research and epidemiological methodology. Uh, EPI has provided study design methodology to environmental health studies, and it helps with understanding the descriptive and analytic studies that are involved in environmental health. So here are some special design considerations when we're talking about environmental epidemiology. Cross-sectional studies are very common because we can study a large population. For instance, if we are looking at, a, at something like the NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, that is considered, while it is a cohort in terms of they're following the U.S. population in general over time, when we look at a given year of data, it's a cross-sectional study. What was somebody exposed to and what is the outcome at that point in time? and not following them over time. Of course, in a cross-sectional study, one of the caveats is always that there's a temporality issue. So we have to think about the fact that we don't necessarily know everything that happened before. We don't necessarily know the other factors that could be colliding or influencing the outcomes because we're looking at one point in time usually. Uh, molecular epidemiology is a sub-focus or a subfield of epi that is very specific to environmental health. It's actually what I've been trained in. And we are looking at biomarkers in humans. We're thinking about all different kinds of biologic markers. Um, for, in, it, for example, urine, blood, DNA, hair, nails, teeth. There's so much information that can be provided by each of those biomarkers. Some are more invasive than others. And it really depends on the study what it is that would be the best matrix, perhaps, for getting that information that you want from a human. And also thinking about exposure mixtures, whether, um, so environmental, I'm sorry, molecular epidemiology is where we would be thinking about our exposure mixtures, but also what are the best matrices for evaluating those mixtures? Could everything come from blood? Could everything come from DNA? It really depends on your research question and it depends on your study design, how invasive your population will allow you to be. It also depends on what is the best chemical consideration in terms of the lab laboratory analysis for whether you can use just one, biomark one um, biologic marker or not. Environmental toxicology I've referred to also, and this is where we're talking about risk assessment. And this is also where it's, some experimental design comes into play because this is where you might see animal experiments or um, cell experiments in order to determine a co the conditions for dose response. So the dose of an exposure, which is something that we can't necessarily experiment on humans or determine definitively from humans. So it's much easier to do that in a toxicology lab. And then latency is something to consider it's something to consider in all of epidemiology, but definitely in environmental epidemiology. As I mentioned already, there's temporality issues with cross-sectional designs, but we always have to think about the latency of a design. What is the time between an initial exposure, if we know what that initial exposure is and when it happened, and then that health outcome that we're measuring? When can we actually measure that health outcome? It really de depends on the health outcome. It depends on the exposure at hand and what we already know or can deduce about what the outcomes might be from a, health ex from a particular exposure. Latency can range from seconds with an acute exposure and outcome situation. So you know immediately that uh, something might, a radiation burn might happen or some other form of chemical burn is going to happen immediately versus 
decades. So in the instance of something like cancer, where you might have an exposure, but you may not see the effect of that exposure for a long time, for a decade, maybe for a generation. So this is a, a way to think about the a framework of the environmental epidemiology exposure, um, thinking from, from soup to nuts in a way. So we have a source of our exposure, and that can either be stationary or mobile, meaning perhaps for stationary, a factory and a smokestack, or for mobile, airplanes or cars, something that is moving and taking its exposure with it as it moves versus a stationary source that you may be, you're, you're living near it, you're working near it or in it, and you have, you kind of have to go to it in order to have that exposure. But it can also be a stationary location and those exposures, if they're in the air or in the water, those will move, but the original source is stationary in one place. And that relates then to the emissions. Where do the emissions from the source go? Is it in the air? Is it in the water? Does it wind up in our food sources? Is it in products that we are using on our skin, for instance? So, and they may also be related, but thinking just where, how, what is that exposure in terms of that emission from the source? And then if there's, a, in terms of concentration, if there's the amount that we receive, uh, which is also then related to the exposure. Uh, and then whether we are thinking about a single source or a single exposure or multiple exposures that may happen concomitantly because they're, they're, they're happening in terms of emissions together, right? So we have a product that might touch the skin that is going to have more than just one chemical that we're exposed to. Or from that smokestack from a factory, there's going to be multiple exposures from that smokestack, even if they're only making one product or they're only making one, doing one thing that makes that smoke. We have to think about the distance we are from the exposure. Is it direct? Is it indirect? Um, is it, how long is that exposure? As I mentioned with acute and chronic, perhaps it takes very little time. You don't need to be too close to it and you will still have an outcome. Perhaps it would take longer time for that exposure to actually have an effect on you. And it really is dependent on what chemical or physical exposure we're talking about. It's, each one is unique. But something that is very determined in terms of human health, for sure, there's three main routes of exposure. Oral, so ingested usually, um, somehow getting into the mouth and getting into our, our um, digestive tract, and then being able to get throughout the body through the blood, um, inhaled, so we're breathing it in, usually through the nose, but you can also think about inhalation of something like a cigarette, a dermal, which would be the skin. So whether we're touching something, whether we're applying it intentionally to our skin, that's going to potentially be a root of exposure. And of course, like anything else, these roots of exposure can be combined at the same time. It just depends, again, on what the item, what the exposure of interest in is. And I'll be getting to that too. I'll be giving a few examples. Um, then there's, in terms of dose, there's, in, there's a variety of ways to measure dose, um, but really definitely thinking about internal dosage. How does it get into our body? How much gets into our body after exposure? And then what's the biologically effective dose after we, experience this exposure, how much does it take from that internal dose to have an effect? And then finally, the health effects, whether it's something that will happen acutely after exposure, whether it happens over time, and then we wind up with a chronic outcome, such as asthma, cancer, obesity, diabetes, something that needs to be controlled in a chronic, at a chronic state, or whether it's something acute, such as an infection or a rash or a, a, a temporary cough because there's something in the air, your lungs clear it, and then you're, you're okay. And I'd like to just talk about who some at-risk populations are. And there, this, this is not an exhaustive list. 
but definitely we're talking about older adults today, right? We're finally getting to that part. Um, but I have them asterisks for a reason. There's other at-risk populations that I just want to point out. There's pregnant people, children, and adolescents, and I have them asterisked also, and we'll find out why in a moment. Underserved populations and individuals with chronic illness. These are among the at-risk populations that you may see in the literature. Have a, There's a focus on ensuring that those populations have environmental justice, have reduced risk of exposure, and that we're considering them in our design of studies. Now, the reason I asterisked the older adults and the uh, pregnant people and children and adolescents is because they actually, of course, are, that's all dealing with age and age falls on a spectrum. And there's something called the developmental origins of health and disease theory. It's also, once upon a time, the original person who developed this theory, his name was Bark, his last name was Barker, and it's also been referred to as Barker's hypothesis. So it basically says that Exposures that we receive early in life, and that can be defined in different ways, whether it's prenatal, so in the utero, in utero, or whether that is something that happens during the childhood, early childhood, middle childhood, late childhood, adolescence, whether it's multiple exposures, chronic exposure, one-time exposure, that those exposures are going to affect us throughout life. So adult onset health outcomes may be, depending again on the exposures, may be associated with an exposure that happens early in life and then it, it, you carry it through your life. And there's another sort of off the cusp type, uh, off the cuff type uh, way of referring to it as cradle to grave. So if, it would be wonderful, they're very expensive the, if they exist, the few that may exist, a longitudinal study that follows a cohort from birth until death. That is perhaps an ideal in the situation of DOHAD because you'd be able to see what happens when they're in utero all the way through childhood, all the way through early adulthood, middle adulthood, and late adulthood, and see what exposures actually do matter in populations. And so a few resources for you. In terms of current research, there's child and health, child health and development studies that um, I'm going to be referring to actually a little bit later on. Uh, there's the Dutch Hunger Winter Study, which is a famous, well-known study in epidemiology that uh, that looked at children, uh, Dutch children during World War II, there, or there was a famine and the health effects, and they followed those children throughout time. The Framingham Heart Study is another excellent resource to think about for older adult um, outcomes, and they've started thinking about exposures. And then also the Atomic Bomb Survivors Lifespan Study, which, as I mentioned, um, radiation is a consideration and how that may have happened early in life, and then what happens as you get older. So. I've now introduced you to at-risk populations. I've introduced you to the idea of the age spectrum from young to old, but what about exposures later in life? So just as a introduction, life expectancy at birth um, and age 65 by sex in the United States. So I'm focusing on the United States in, in this uh, framework. And so we know that um, in general, life expectancy is into the late 70s in the United States. Uh, depends on, there's a sex difference between men and women, between males and females, of approximately 70, the late 70s for males and the early 80s for females. And so we have to think about what does it mean to be exposed later in life? And what does it mean for quality of life and for health outcomes, especially by the time that you that an individual hits their 70s or 80s, they probably are carrying with them some health outcome already. And do exposures later in life have an impact? Are they carrying with them exposures from early in life? What does it, how does it all come together and what does it mean? And we're, I often say the study of environmental health is very young. It, it's really 
since about the 70s that we've been studying environmental health and really focusing on the environment ever since especially the EPA came to be in the early 70s. So we're still learning. We're still trying to figure out exactly what it means to, to be exposed to different points in life. We also want to think about the population pyramid. This is something that in public health is very helpful when you're thinking about a, a country or a city. What does that population look like in terms of age spectrum? And so for the entire United States, this is what the population pyramid looks like. We, the, it's, a, it's a pretty stable population because we our base, although our base is getting a little bit smaller, we'll see what happens over time. But as would be expected, with longer life expectancy, we're having more people up at the top of the pyramid more people that are hitting that those nine the age range of the 90s into 100. And so what about that tip of the pyramid? How do we help people in terms of environmental exposures at the top of the pyramid which is continuing to grow? And we see that in th in this chart population by age group as ha is growing, right? So we have the those middle adults into later adulthood, 25 to 64, continues to grow. And just above it, the 65 plus year olds are also continuing to grow. So there's an, a renewed focus in environmental health shifting towards the older population. In 2012, the WHO Director General made a, a big statement at the Gerontology Con, uh, I'm sorry, at the Gerontology Congress. She said, being in the older age group is becoming the new normal for the world's population. Our seniors are now our biggest age group. And within the next five years, so she was predicting from 2012 to 2017, for the first time in history, the number of adults aged 65 and older will outnumber children under the age of five. So we are starting to see a shift worldwide, potentially in those population pyramids that I just showed you for the U.S. So we know an already at-risk population for environmental exposures is growing on a global scale. And we really have to think about not just what their exposures were early in childhood, but also how are we helping those people? What is going on in the built environment? Because the built environment is part of environmental health. How are we ensuring that their health is taken care of and that outcomes aren't made worse or new outcomes don't develop? For instance, with the built environment are spaces and pathways available that encourage older people to keep fit and active. This is a, an important question in clinical care too. It's a, it would be a, it's a great question to ask older adults when they come in for care. What, what is your environment like? And to think about whether or not something can be done in terms of facilities. Are there accommodations and modifications that can be made to facilitate and encourage exercise? And also, is there something about their housing? Because that's where people tend to spend a lot of their time that will compensate for declining functional capability. So reduction in physical capability. Are there ways that we can accommodate the built environment or change the built environment to make it easier for mobility, like traffic lights being timed specifically so that older adults can get around easier? So while we know that exposures can be chronic over the lifetime, they may start in utero, they may start in early childhood, they may start later in life, we also are thinking about mixtures of those um, exposures. Are the old mixtures, new mixtures, there's new chemicals that are put out onto market every day, in, at least in the United States. Um, so there are older exposures that have to be considered from when an older adult was young versus new exposures that may be coming about today as, we do, as new chemicals are developed. Temporality can be very difficult to discern in older adults. Unless you've been following an older adult, unless an older adult has been extremely cognizant of what they've been exposed to over their lifetime, it's very difficult to determine at what point an exposure may have occurred. And then, what else can we do to modify risk factors? Well, health education. And so that's also part of what I would propose could be 
introduced into clinical care in terms of older adults to definitely provide education about their environment so that they can also have some responsibility and be sure that they're taking care of their environment for themselves. So I said that we'd be, I'd be talking about a few exposures. And so these are the ones that I'll be focusing on in terms of modifiable risk factors for age-related diseases. So there's heat stress, extreme weather events, or as I mentioned already, climate change, climate crisis, climate emergency. The list goes on for the ways that we can talk about climate change. Lead, the chemical lead. Uh, bisphenol A, which is in plastic, and air pollution, which is another big topic, but I'll, I'll be narrowing it down for us. So thinking first about heat stress and extreme weather events, it is actually not only an emerging area of study over the past 20 years, there's been a, more of a ramp up of studying this. It's also an emerging area of study in older adults and thinking about what happens when there's heat stress and extreme weather events? Urban heat islands are something to think about, especially in our population of older adults where we have to think about what is their access to cooling centers? What is their, ac what is their access to air conditioning? How do they remain cool? Dilapidated housing is also an issue when we think about not just heat stress and insulation, but also extreme weather events and whether or not an extreme weather event like a hurricane or a tornado would affect their ability to have a to, to not have a negative health outcome from an extreme weather event and whether they are protected in their housing. So infrastructure considerations, much like housing, when you have flooding, what happens to mobility? Older adults are less mobile in general and how can they get around once an extreme weather event has occurred? If there's transportation access issues, that's, that's an environmental exposure. I mentioned access to cooling centers. And then also when there's an extreme weather event, there could be a problem with access to food. An individual may already live in a food desert, but then if there's a problem in terms of climate change where there's short-term access to food availability, how do we solve that problem? Lead has been around for a long time, and there's been a variety of regulation with lead that has tried to reduce exposures to lead. However, when we're thinking about an older population, we know that the regulations that have been put in in the 1970s and beyond in terms of lead would not necessarily make a difference to exposures that an older population may have had in younger life. So another issue with lead is that it is stored in bones. So if you are exposed to lead, it will deposit in bones. It will also be excreted, but it will have approximately 20 to 30 years half-life in your bones. And in adults, approximately 80 to 95% of retained lead is kept in the bones. It eventually will come out, but exposures will remain in the body. Lead in your bones will increase with age, so this is true of everybody. And we, it's known that by age 70, more than one third of bone mass will contain lead that was acquired early in life. So remember, there are regulations that have come about that are protecting younger people and everybody really these days. But once upon a time, there was no regulation. There was lead in paint, there was lead in gasoline, and there was exposure to those areas for lead. Um, bisphenol A or BPA is a common plasticizer. It's found in plastic and its production also predates a lot of regulation that we have now for some chemicals, including BPA. Uh, the production began in the 1950s, so right after World War II, plastic became the, one of the new wonderful products that um, that was actually, BPA was discovered to be a plasticizer both in the United States and in Germany in two different companies. And there was just a proliferation of plastic products after the 1950s. 
BPA has a very short half-life. So unlike lead, it has a, a short half-life of about four hours. It's easily excreted. But the problem is, great, it gets out of, it, it can leave the body. But there's ubiquitous exposure. We're exposed to it every day, all day, from a variety of products and sources. Diet is considered the main route of exposure for BPA because of food contact. In, in our plastic serving utensils and serviceware and linings and cans and other food containers. Um, there's also some replacements that have come onto the market. There's BPS and BPF. However, they're even less studied than BPA. So, and they're very similar in structure to BPA. And there's a continued growth of global demand for plastic, which will include BPA. Air pollution, again, a big topic, but to boil it down, um, so there's stationary sources and mobile sources of air pollution. I'd mentioned smokestacks earlier. I'd mentioned airplanes and cars earlier. So we can think about all the different ways that there's pollution that can get into the air, but there's also not just things that we make, that humans make, anthropogenic sources. There's, of course, natural sources. So there would be air pollution, what we might consider air pollution no matter what in the world, uh, volcanoes and sandstorms and a variety of other naturally occurring events that would create air pollution for, that would be of concern. But we have added to that mix. ETS, or environmental tobacco smoke, I mentioned earlier inhaling environmental exposures. And so cigarettes are one way, of course, but there's other ways of, of, uh, of smoking tobacco. There's other methods besides cigarettes. And there's a number of pollutants that fall into the air pollution category. PHs or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, heavy metals are in the air, particulate matter. So that's basically just the size of a, of a, of a pollutant that uh, can get into the lungs. And it can be a variety of things. It's not a specific chemical. Black carbon, ozone, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen dioxide are common air pollutants that are studied at a large level. Um, and then built environment and how we use the land, that's, those can be other factors related to land, to air pollution. Just think about Next time you see a roadway being paved with asphalt, that's built environment, that's land use, and that's air pollution. So I've covered some exposures. I've talked about older adults, and now we're, I'm going to try to pull it together for you in terms of outcomes in older adults from environmental exposures. What, the first exposure I mentioned was heat stress and in extreme weather events. So what are some outcomes that we see in older adults? Well, most definitely in heat stress, there's an effect on the central nervous system. And so we know that older adults are more susceptible to heat stress. CNS effects include memory loss, confusion, delirium. So when exposed to heat stress, we can start to see that there will be impacts on mental health, and then think about mobility, what I mentioned before, and access to food and transportation. These are major concerns for the older population when exposed to heat. In terms of the cardiovascular system, heat will increase the risk for a heart attack. So as we age, we are at potentially already at increased risk for cardiovascular disease, increased risk of heart attack, and perhaps one already has a history of cardiovascular disease, and now being exposed to extreme heat will exacerbate that. And that's often a concern when, when individuals have chronic disease to think about exposures that may exacerbate existing disease or existing health outcomes. In terms of the gastrointestinal system, there's an increased risk of pathogens, that could be from food source, that could be waterborne. It really depends on the population and what, the, what their living environment is. In an urban area versus a rural area, there's also a rise, there's 
a documented rise in gastroenteritis-related death in older adults. So not only gastrointestinal health outcomes, but potentially death rates that could be attributed to gastrointestinal disease. And then thermal homeostasis, so just something very basic, but still a health outcome. There's a diminished ability for thermal homeostasis in older adults. And they have some difficulty with lowering their body core, their, the, the temperature in their bodies, with, with sweat. So because of that, there's also a risk of dehydration in older adults. So again, going back to mobility, transportation, extreme weather events, whether they have access to food, water, whether they're prepared, are they near a cooling center, do they have air conditioning? All of these factors are ways to mitigate the risk. But we have to start thinking about that now, before those events happen. Lead exposure in older adults can lead to a variety of outcomes also. Osteoporosis, which older adults are at risk of, in particular, females. Um, lead can have an effect on, in terms of um, bone resorption. There's, um, while there's a protective effect on osteoporosis in women who, or in people who've been pregnant, um, there is still a concern with lead exposure. Um, it can affect bone mineral metabolism, and it can decrease mineral density or bone mineral density. There's already an increased risk in older adults of fractures and falls, fall being one of the number one causes of death in older adults. But when you add lead to it and you reduce mineral metabolism and mineral density, now you have an increased risk from fractures and falls. It also, lead will inhibit the activation of vitamin D and uptake of calcium. So there's chemical effects that lead will have in the body. And of course, that's going to be related to diet. And then there's neuropsychological effects. So lead is a well-known neuropsychological exposure or uh, a well-known exposure that has neuropsychological, neurodevelopmental effects, but also neuropsychological effects. So imagine multiple exposures right here. I just talked about heat stress and problems of cognition. Now, if you have lead exposure also, perhaps there's that dilapidated housing I mentioned. You have potential for cognitive problems. There could, and this has been studied with lead exposure in older adults, that there's an impact on cognitive function tests. And there's also a relationship between lead exposure in, a, in older adults and psychiatric symptoms, such as depression, anxiety, irritability, and anger. So lead can have an effect on neurobehavior. Lead can have an effect on metabolic syndrome outcomes. So there's an, in, an increased uh, occurrence of metabolic syndrome outcomes, negative metabolic syndrome outcomes. There's also um, an altered alteration in thyroid stimulating hormone levels, which would be part of the metabolic syndrome effects. So it, again, it has effects on hormones. It has effects on chemicals in the body. It can be related to diet, and it can be related to behavioral outcomes. And then in terms of ANS or the autonomic nervous system, you can have an increase in sympathetic and in, an increase in sympathetic activity and a decrease in parasympathetic activity in the ANS. And so that can also be related to heart rate variability. And at that point, we're starting to tie it together potentially with cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular outcomes. So lead is a major problem that there's been some regulation, but again, older adults may have been exposed prior to the regulation and there may be existing lead in their home environment, such as an old paint that hasn't been scraped off the wall. BPA, which is in plastics and in many products that touch our food, has been well-documented and associated with obesity, so both general and central obesity. Um, it can, it's been defined by, with waist circumference, and there's a positive association between bisphenol A exposure and BMI. It also can 
affect body weight regulation. So just the ability to normalize one's body weight. In terms of the cardiovascular, we're starting to see some overlap, right, in outcomes. So some of the exposures can come from the same source. Some of these different environmental exposures could all be from a, sim a similar or same source. But on the other hand, different sources, different exposures, but we could have similar health outcomes. How do we disentangle that? That's part of where epidemiology and statistical methods come into play. So in BPA, we have cardiovascular system outcomes, such as an increase in blood pressure that's seen in older adults, and again, a risk for CVD or cardiovascular diseases, such as coronary heart disease, heart attack, angina. BPA also tied in with metabolic syndrome, not unlike lead. It does have a relationship, though, with insulin and hyperglycemia, which could be, of course, related with obesity. So you start to see how things start to overlap with environmental exposures. There's the association of BPA with diabetes outcomes and abnormal liver function. And then once again, with autonomic nervous system, much like lead, there's a relationship with heart rate variability. Again, that could be connected with cardiovascular outcomes. And air pollution, big topic, lots of different types of pollutants in the air. But in summation, here's some of the outcomes that are quite common when exposed to various types of air pollution. Respiratory, of course, we all breathe the air. Air pollution is related with, to reduction in lung, in lung function. It's related to an increased rate of decline in lung function, and it's also associated with emphysema. Now, of course, where does that air pollution come from? Hard to say in terms of what the outcomes could be. You really have to run a study, and then it could be complicated when people are smokers or exposed to environmental smoke. Cardiovascular system, again, we see issues with the cardiovascular system. Here we have increased blood pressure. There's also a relationship with the telomere length, which could have an effect on the cardiovascular disease. And there's an association with, or a possible association with heart attack and cardiovascular death. Not unlike BPA, there's a relationship between air pollution and, ins and insulin. Um, so increased insulin resistance, again, in association with diabetes, which could be related to obesity. And there's also susceptible genotypes that are known in terms of insulin resistance and the relationship with air pollution exposure. And then finally, cancer. This is now, we didn't see cancer with the other exposures I introduced you to. But definitely air pollution is a considerable exposure in terms of cancer, not just lung cancer. Yes, we all breathe in, we all use our lungs, and we're all exposed to pollutants in the air in our lungs, but also colorectal cancer and breast cancer. And we can't rule out the relationship with ETS necessarily. Of course, a, a study would have to be done in order to determine whether environmental tobacco smoke has a relationship with these cancers as well because there's also other cancers besides lung cancers that come from environmental, from, from smoking and from environmental tobacco smoke. And then I just wanted to touch on DDTs and pesticides and that a recent, uh, recent literature has shown that there are intergenerational effects. Now, while the, it's not talking about the exposures in older adults, it's actually talking about exposures that happened earlier in life and then are carried forward. So it was a grandma and mother and a child study, and they found that obesity and early onset menstruation, breast cancer, and cardio cardiometabolic disease were related to DDT pesticide exposure. And those were exposures that had to have happened before the 1972 ban. So remember, there's a lot of regulation on chemicals that happened in the 1970s. But of course, our older adults may have been exposed to DDT. And what they're seeing is that there's an effect two generations later. So I have just a bit of thought exercise for you in terms of clinical practice. And my caveat, of course, is that I'm not a clinician, um, but it is something that 
I think, I strongly believe needs to be incorporated into clinical practice. If it's not already, we need to be thinking about environmental health and environmental exposures when patients are coming in with various health outcomes, especially for chronic disease where you could be providing suggestions and asking questions over time and incorporating it into the disease outcome solutions. I think, okay, this is supposed to say brainstorm, but just to think about, um, you know, if I was doing a back and forth, a live presentation back and forth and getting questions and answers and having some discussion, I would ask you, and you can do this right now, but in geriatric clinical practice, how can environmental exposures be better assessed in patients? What can we do in order to really make sure that we're getting down to the root cause or root associations between exposures and outcomes? So asking them questions that I've covered, what is their environment like? Where do they live? What is their housing like? How old is their housing? What is their access to food? Do they drive? How close are they near a subway station or a bus station? At least thinking in New York City. Um, what is their social environment? Do they have people who can help them? If there's a major wet climate event, if there's a major weather event, if they're flooded, who will help them and how will they get out of their home to get to safer shelter? This was a problem that actually happened with Hurricane Sandy where people were trapped in their homes, in large high-rises, and which are probably beneficial for many people because you have access to a lot of amenities when you're in a large building unit. However, with a flood, you may lose power, you may not be able to use an elevator, etc. So how can these people be helped? How can patients be helped both when they have chronic outcomes, but also to prevent acute and chronic outcomes. And I propose, I would propose we could use um, pediatric environmental health specialty units as a template or as a model to be thinking about how to do this because this is already being done in pediatric populations. There's a national PEHSU. They have a health toolkit. It includes patient surveys, fact sheets, and webinars for clinicians. It's completely free, it's available online, and it's also user-friendly in terms of for the, for the patients. So they can download onto their mobile dev devices, onto their computers, their family members can also, and there's also free continuing education. And this is all developed from the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, so ATSDR. There's the quality of life skill that could be used. Uh, as I mentioned, quality of life. What is, what is happening in the older adult population? What is their material and physical well-being? These are all questions that could be asked. Their social environment, their relationships, their family. What about, what makes them happy? Their personal development and fulfillment. Are they near a park? Remember green space? That's the, what everybody thinks is the environment. That's the first answer. What are their recreational potential in their neighborhood where they live and how do they get to it so i want to provide a few additional resources for some of the items that i've talked about um, so atd atsdr is available from they're a part of the cdc the federal government the epa which i also mentioned which started in the 1970s when a lot of regulation started to ramp up in terms of environmental exposures the National Institute on Aging, of course, a wonderful resource, and they are starting to develop a lot of research with older adult populations and environmental exposures, as well as the NIEHS, or the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, which, of course, has a focus on research and environmental health. So hopefully you find these resources useful. And, of course, some acknowledgments. And that's it. Thank you.